talk a little bit about how to animate, pretty much. And uh, we're going to talk about our own experiences in North American Studios here in Vancouver, and uh, what we, what the differences are between anime made in uh, Japan and animation made here, and just give you a quick overview on how the production pipeline for 2D animation goes. So, yeah. Um... Pretty much, I'll give you guys a little bit of a background on each of us as well before we get into the breakdown that you see here. So again, my name is Daniel Silaji. I'm uh, an artist. I've been working here in Vancouver for about six years now. I actually started in television myself. I came out of uh, Vancouver Film School as a 2D animation student. And I started doing color work, I've done storyboarding, I've done animation. Um, then I moved into video games a couple years ago and I started working in um, basically mobile games. I did iPhone and Android games. And uh, most recently now, I'm working at United Front Games on the upcoming Halo game for Xbox One. So that's out this fall, so if anyone's a fan, you know, be sure to play it. Um, and yeah, Tiffany? Uh, okay, I guess we came from the same place. I'm also a graduate of Vancouver Film School and 2D animation and 3D as well. Um, I started working at Delaney and Friends, which is probably an old studio no one's ever heard of, but they did a lot of big shows back in the day. Uh, then we moved on to Bardell, where I did flash animation, 2D animation, storyboard, layout, character design, and uh, eventually I decided to start my own studio, which is Kyger Productions, in case you're wondering what that card's all about. Uh, and of course, with all my great friends that I've met along the way, through various studios, we've um, come to an agreement that we love anime and we love the production style. And that's pretty much what our studio is focused on. So at the moment, um, we're doing graphic novels in manga style, obviously, and uh, multi-platform games. Uh, and we actually just wrapped up an animated short that's um, going to be debuting in New York in two weeks. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it, I think. Yeah, so just to sort of further talk on what you mentioned when we started. So this is kind of an anima animation panel. We're going to go over all the key points here. We're going to go over some differences between animation now it's done in North America through our experiences with studios here, and then how animation is done obviously in Japan, how you see most of the anime that you see on television or online, how that's kind of done. The purpose of this panel is not to actually do a comparison as in a versus comparison. We're not trying to say one is better than the other. We're not trying to say that you know one has better practices. There's huge differences in cultural terms, in terms of how things are done. So we just want to kind of highlight some of that stuff to give people an understanding of how things are done. And just to enlighten people here in general to say like, you know, a lot of people don't know how cartoons are properly done from a script to final color and sound that you see on TV and sort of what goes in between all those steps and sort of what happens with the art and the sound and compositing and all that kind of stuff. So we got our breakdown here, which we'll kind of go over um, each section a little bit. Um, obviously, the script is pretty self-explanatory, but Tiffany's going to go into some detail with that and start us off. Yeah, so a script for animation is very similar to a screenplay for a movie or a television series. Uh, pretty much you got all your print in information included with your character dialogue, your character actions, and probably something that may not be included in a film script would be camera direction. And that's something that would be very important and key for the storyboard artist to work from in an animation script. Uh, yeah, so that's a good, a good point to actually bring up is, so scripts in North America generally, in Canada and the US, and even in Europe, most of the time they do not include notes on camera. They'll give things like examples of setting. They'll say, you know, uh, exterior, you know, camp setting, daytime, nighttime, etc., and then give you an idea like that. But they won't go into the detail of saying, you know, exact close-up shot, pan over. They will mention those things and they'll make those notes, but they're not as specifically detailed to the artist. They let the artist kind of have a little bit more creative freedom in that respect, at least here. Okay, should we move on to storyboard? Oh, something else we wanted to mention. Uh, some of the, one of the major differences between the North American studios and the Japanese studios is how the animation departments are structured. So here in North America, uh, each department is quite separate from each other. So the scriptwriter will never talk to the uh, animators, for example. 
and the director usually has very little involvement with the actual script writing and how that comes about. It just lands in his lap and then it's his job to go from there, pretty much. And in Japan, uh, it's very different in where the director is very involved with the production process, starting from the beginning through the script, through storyboarding, and they're very hands-on, which is very, <laughs> Yeah, you know. it's a little different here. We don't do it as much. Um, like Tiffany said, the directors in Japan are definitely much more involved with the script. They're often in the meetings when this writing takes place, when the pitches and ideas kind of go through. Here, not so much. Usually all the writers will communicate with each other, but they usually will not speak with directors or animation leads or any, anything like that. It's kind of handled sort of separately, and then everyone else kind of gets hired on afterwards. So you have your director assigned, your leads assigned, uh, much later into the production after the script sort of uh, wrapped up and approved. But um, yeah, so going on into that, we're going to get into storyboards, which is arguably the most important part Ooh, of yes. the entire pi uh, production pipeline. The reason it's key is because you start getting into all your elements are done here. You got your layouts, you got your positionings, your animations, your keys, like everything can be diverged from your boards. Um, so for example here, this is Obviously, much more. This is a Japanese style storyboard. In these cases, these are both from the uh, animation show Samurai Champloo, uh, which is also done by the same director who did Cowboy Bebop, for those who remember. Uh, yeah, um, this pretty much defines the outcome of your animation. So it includes all your um, camera moves and key animation. And oftentimes, at least in North America, they will directly take the storyboard panel and blow it up to the actual size and just use that as their template to animate the scene. And uh, the storyboard... Um, oh, totally <laughs> lost my train of thought. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, for example, like looking back at the Japanese style, we can see that their line work is also a lot more different. It's a lot more intricate. You can see much more details on the character's face and overall body, the structure, posing, even the backgrounds are much, much more detailed than you would find in North American. So, for comparison, here's an example of North American storyboard. This is from the show Symbiotic Titan, which is done by the director uh, Kenny Tortikowski, who also did Samurai Jack and who did a lot of other. Uh, shows Dexter's Laboratory, if anyone remembers. Uh, but you can see that basically here, like, it's not so much about the background, it's more about the character posing, it's more about setting them up, and then sort of showing reactions and stuff like that. It's not as dynamic or as fast-paced. Obviously, there are things that you have to keep in mind between the two, like, if we look back, obviously, Samurai Shampoo is a much more action-oriented show. You're going to see a lot of quick cuts, a lot of action, a lot of stuff like that. Whereas this show, although it does have a lot of action, is not the same kind of action. You're not going to see those same exact cuts. And these kind of pertain to the two different styles between North American and Japanese. Wow, that pretty much wraps it up. <laughs> uh, just another side note, um, in animation production, we usually define a scene in an animation by whenever there's a cut between scenes. So even if it's the same location, it's still considered a scene, a separate scene, a new scene. And in Japan, they do the same thing, but they call it a cut instead of a scene. So this is a cut, this is a cut, this is a cut, rather than this is a scene, this is a scene, this is a scene. <laughs> yeah, North America tends to do that also, just to keep things under control in terms of production. So because everything's sort of packaged on, you won't have an animator, say, do an entire sequence. Like, for example, here, you know, if this was done in Japan, and which actually was, uh, I believe the original Batman series was actually animated in Japan, but um, the way it would be done over there is you, you wouldn't have, you know, you would have an artist pretty much handle this entire sequence. Whereas in North America, if it was done there, you would only have a little bit of it done. You might have three artists working on this one scene itself, even though it all pertains in the same location and everything, you might have like two or three different people working on it, so. So there's a couple more examples here. So this is obviously from Green Hornet, the movie. Uh, there's differences between storyboarding for movies and film and television as well. We're not getting into film just because that's a whole complete different discussion right there. So for our purposes, we're pretty much sticking to television animation uh, for both North American and Japanese. But just to give you an example, um, storyboards for film are generally a lot more 
Uh, you don't have to be as detailed or as pose specific because mostly it's just for the director to look at it and get an idea of where things are located, where characters are going to be on camera, how they should position things, and then they kind of just go from there. It's more of a template and a guide rather than an absolute kind of thing. Um, so these are from, I didn't say we were going to get into, I just said we're not going to get into film, but this is actually from uh, Spirited Away, obviously Miyazaki, very well known. What's important to know with something like this is that Miyazaki is a good exception because his boards are so precise and detailed. He actually does a lot of them himself, which is quite rare uh, for most directors uh, in North America. They will not board their scenes. They'll have an artist do that for them. In Japan, they tend to have the director actually board a good chunk of them themselves. And another note, you've probably noticed that a lot of the storyboards are looking very different. Um, they all come in different shapes and sizes, and it really depends on the studio. Each studio has their own template, so, uh, I mean, even here you don't even have dialogue description or anything. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you can see, like, as Tiffany was saying, you know, some, some studios will have one side where they'll have all the art and the other side with direction notes, camera, expression changes, stuff like that. You can see some of their notes here where they're explaining you know, action cuts and what's sort of happening. They might even make notes of effects animation, which a different artist will do. Uh, so just some differences to keep in mind. Um, and with that, we're going to move right into uh, layouts and stuff like that as well. OK, uh, should we talk about animatics before layouts? Or, uh... Yeah, actually, yeah. Sorry, let's backtrack just yeah, a little bit. So in between, we're just kind of going in order of a typical production here. Uh, animatics is basically taking your storyboard panels and putting them into a sequential film. And this is where timing is pretty much um, laid down for the animators. And uh, that's where it would be combined with the slugging for the voice actors. So at that point, in a typical North American studio, all the voice actors' lines would be recorded and mixed in with the animatic as a guide so that they can time all the scenes out. So to animate, it has to be very, very precise with the timing. And of course, you have 22 minutes on air, so they have to make sure all the dialogue is very cut and clean, and every scene is perfectly timed to fit within that time frame. Yeah, animatics are obviously very, very critical and crucial. They give the entire feel of the episode as soon as you see it. Like, the director can pretty much say, look at it, and look and see the pacing. If the cuts are quick or too quick or not, you know, long enough, if things need to happen. Basically, if you see a good animatic, a good example of an animatic, it should almost read as a full episode itself. You should be able to look at it, understand completely what's going on, and still feel like it's kind of like a rough, non-colored show. Um, sometimes that's not the case. In North America, sometimes they don't take as much time to do it, and they kind of just rush through it, but, um, you know, it's obviously it just depends on the studio, it depends on the budget. Uh, depends on a lot of different factors, so. Okay, and layout. So just important to note here, these are from Lilo and Stitch from the Disney feature movie. Uh, I included these in because these are a good example of more story art, which also relates to layout. This is not a specific layout drawing. This is not what you would see or not be handed if you were working in studio in North America. For the purpose of these, it's just to establish the mood, establish lighting, establish characters and positions. So you can see in that example there, even though it's a little bit blurry on the screen, you can see that's like Lilo's bedroom, obviously. So it's a good, this is something that you would use, um, surfboard artists would also use down the road if they're doing further things as a reference point. You can see like, you know, that's the house, that's the diner. Um, it's meant as a good guide point. Uh, usually story art and storyboards kind of go at the same time. They're usually, sometimes they're done, one is done before the other. Sometimes when uh, they're doing a, a show, they don't quite know what things are gonna look like right away, so they just wanna get a quick feel. They'll have a little bit of a description from the script, but they don't, haven't gone in with the board artists yet to actually flesh it out. So they'll hire a story artist in the case of film and actually have that. In television, you would probably have like your character artist who will do something like this. They'll come up with the background, they'll come up with the characters, and etc. So yeah, so these are some more examples. So on the side here we have things from Avatar The Last Airbender. Um, you can kind of see that this is some of their layout shots. Obviously these are colored and final art, but basically the pencil drawings would be the same, minus the color and sort of the effects. Uh, to the side, you see more feature film stuff, so it's from Emperor's New Groove, uh, the top and the bottom. 
um, and then moving along, just have some more stuff for Persian New Groove. So again, more feature stuff, you can see it's much more polished, a lot more time has been put in to do this. Um, yeah, so another part of layouts is uh, the character positioning. This is usually what the key animator will use to uh, position the character in each scene and complete all the rough uh, the key animations. And then that gets handed off to the in-betweeners. Yeah, and actually that brings us right to our key animation points. Mm -hmm. So again, the, this is from uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, uh, actually from the first, uh, first season, I believe, near the end. Um, but you can see that they've separated off. There's different colors in this case because you can see that they're going to separate off the effects animation and the tones and the highlights, which we'll get into more down the road. Um, but right now, just for the purposes of seeing the characters move, this is sort of what is pretty much it. It's basically from one position to the next position. Those are, those are considered your keys. Yeah, they just take the most extreme action in each movement and that is your key. So it's easy for the in-betweeners to just kind of fill in the gaps in between, right? Yeah, so actually we're going to show you a good video example nice. of uh, some of that stuff. And uh, bring that up. And this is uh, kind of illustrating what a key animation would be. Right foot, and then the next one would be the, the left foot out for someone walking, for example. So typically there are 24 frames a second in animation, and most of the time, the drawings are done on two, so one drawing would equal to two frames. That's just average. Sometimes in action shots, they'll do the whole sequence on one. It really depends. And sometimes on talking shots, you can have one layer where they're there for like a minute and all that's moving is the mouth. There's so many <laughs> combinations here. And that's all you have to go on, folks. <laughs> Should note that an hour is really, really, really fast to do that level of work. Like, that's pretty incredible for her, for somebody who's not yeah. actually like a full-on animator. And yes, animators do do this. We often have a mirror at our desk to make sure we can get those expressions <laughs> to work. Uh, 
Um, their quick checker is also known as a line test machine. <laughs> It's also interesting to note that she actually drew everything on that character in one single drawing. She didn't layer off the gun or the hair or anything like that. Most of the times in animation in North America and Japan, they would actually layer off things like the hair or the gun or the bag for secondary action. So you'd add more frames in animation or less, making it go faster or quicker depending on what's happening. But in her case, she just did it all in one. So it's just something to keep in mind. Like, it's not a standard usually will be assigned things like that, and they'll tell you, but it's just kind of funny that she did it one. <laughs> just comparing her mind work to the professional. <laughs> Alright. So I also want to talk about um, key animation and in-between animation. Now, in North American production pipeline, often the studios here will do the key animation and then ship it off somewhere for outsourcing. So, you know, it's the Philippines or India or China or whatever. Um, it's just the way things are now. Even in Japan, they'll uh, outsource to Korea and other places. So um, that's pretty normal nowadays. Uh, it's really difficult, well, I shouldn't say difficult, I'll just say rare to find a studio that will do every aspect of their production in-house. It's just not economical anymore. <laughs> yeah, I should also note here really quickly for that, um, in terms of like something like this, like uh, kind of an action-y full-on show, like an anime, for example, you would definitely have that sent, like obviously it would be done in you know Japan, Korea, etc. Like Tiffany was saying, a lot of the shows now here that you see on TV, like YTV, um, Cartoon Network, Teletoon, that kind of thing, a lot of the shows are done in Flash here, especially in the city, we're actually well known for having a very robust Flash animation industry here. That is all done in-house, that is mostly done from top to bottom, all here, all the compositing, color, everything that you see will be done here. But it's a different kind of show, obviously, you know, you're not going to see huge action, big effects, that kind of thing. It's mostly kid sort of shows, you know, kid versus cat, um, being -y and that kind of stuff. Those were done mostly here, and they're all done in Flash and, um, and on the computer. A lot of the stuff that we're showing is obviously very, very traditional. It's on paper. Um, you can even see, I don't know if anyone caught it, but she was saying, like, oh, I wish I could just copy this drawing. Well, that's why a lot of it's done on the computer now, because you can just literally copy your drawings, paste them, and then make little tiny tweaks to it, so you don't have to redraw the whole thing each and every time. Um, even Disney now, a lot of the feature films like Princess and the Frog were actually drawn in Cintiqs. They didn't do it on paper anymore, because they just found that it's a lot faster to actually just do it digitally. You can correct it quicker, you don't need to scan it in, you can just check it on your machine as you're working on it. So it's just sped up production, but that being said, like Tiffany said, most of the shows that you see, and definitely animes, are not done all in-house. Sometimes they are, most of the times they're not. You can check the credits and you'll see most of it's done in Korea, most of it's done, some of it's still done in Japan, but most most of it is now done in Korea and China. Okay, so moving on. Yeah, you just pretty much covered that whole difference about doing it on paper versus digital. Uh, so, shall we go to the digital ink and paint? Yes. So we're going to, I'm just going to show you a little example here. Um, yeah. So this will just give you a rough idea of how the process goes. So we started with the rough animation here. So it's really, really sketchy. And this is basically just to get the movements down uh, correctly. We're not we're worrying about how many spikes of hair there are in each drawing. That's for later. <laughs> so we got the basic uh, movement there. Just to note, this is actually Tiffany's animation that she's doing herself, so this isn't like some yeah. show or something that we're doing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, thanks, live stream. Okay. <laughs> so this is the cleanup stage here, and this is where you really do have to catch the each individual hair. So if one is missing between two frames, it's 
like a blink, you can catch it with the eye. So you have to be so tight on the cleans. You'll see it pop, actually, which yeah. is another thing that gets into clean animation. You'll see lines wiggle or boil sometimes if they're not drawn cleanly. So like the girl was saying in the other video where she was drawing it and you can see the difference between a pro and her drawings. One of them was kind of a little bit squiggly more looking. So you can really see that on, on television, especially now with HD and Blu-ray and stuff like that. You see those imperfections a lot more and it's a lot less forgiving than it used to be yeah. back in the days of uh, VHS and tapes oh, and yeah. stuff like that. You'll notice in a lot of older anime, there's some pretty crazy face shapes going on and like they'll change shape in every scene and you know, that's not acceptable nowadays. Just I mean, watch really the uh, watch <laughs> Ninja Turtle show actually, that's a good example oh, yeah. of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, good times. Yeah. So anyway, after the cleans, we get into the flat colors. Um, I know it's, this part varies from studio to studio as well. So in Japan, they often draw the tone and highlight layers right in the same drawing. Uh, the way I do it here is using it by or doing it by layers. So the tone layer is actually plugged into a module that will add a shadow onto it. But you'll see in a sec here. <laughs> And for anyone wondering, the software that she's using is uh, Tube Room Harmony. So mm -hmm. it, it is a software Industry that's standard, yeah. yeah, it's a standard software that they use because it's kind of an all in suite package. You can do your animations, your storyboards, your color. Here's the tones here. Yeah, you can see that there. Yeah, Tube is a great company. They're very uh, well known in professional. Uh, all the major studios use their software. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> And in Japan, they like to use Redis Pro, just so you have comparison there. But they're basically the same thing. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so let's plug in the tones. So a good example of this software, if anyone's not familiar with it, is it's kind of a cross between Maya and Flash, I would say. You have the timeline aspect of Flash on the bottom there, you can kind of see, and you saw a little bit of the nodes that uh, Tiffany was mentioning, so that's more like Maya, where you have like your different um, nodes. Yeah, you can see it there in the corner, you have your little modules. Anything in red, it means it's not turned on. So those are things that are just hidden or not. Yeah. Okay, so once all that coloring is done, the backgrounds are put together, and the camera moves are put together. Oh, oh yeah, we have pictures too. <laughs> oh, these are just some examples of uh, some keyframes that I'm doing for the uh, trailer for our show, Shadow Magic. Uh, we're about to get going on the pilot episode, and we are going to launch that as a Kickstarter sometime early next year. Uh, I don't know what else to say about it, but <laughs> I don't want to sound like I'm like, don't it to our Kickstarter! But, it, you know, uh, <laughs> it'd be cool if you went to check it out. We do have Facebook, it's on your little card there if you picked one up at the door. Um, yeah, so this is, we just kind of plug this in as an example. So this is oh, so like what you would see as a colored product coming out yeah. of Tingu, basically. So you'd have your different, obviously these are all different frames that are now colored and done. But yeah, like Tiffany said, these are pretty much your key frames that she's drawn for this character, so. Oh yes, compositing. So this is where we go into bringing everything together and coming up with what you pretty much see on the screen. Oh, this one. Yeah, this is another scene from the Shadow Magic trailer. Yeah, so for the quality, it's not the best, it's a little bit hard to grab a nice high-res uh, high version to play it. But basically you can see that there's uh, multi-pan layers going on here in the, this background. You have your foreground elements with some of the trees, you have your mid-ground with more trees and bushes, and then you have your further background elements with light and everything that. You can see Tiffany playing with their <laughs> modules to, to fix to get the right desired effect. Um, and obviously as you sort of pan through, you have this long, long pan of this background scene. Yeah, and as far as I know, this is pretty unique to um, Toon Boom's products. I know Anime Pro and Harmony both have this, where you can separate your layers in 3D space. So when you do zoom-ins and camera moves in that way, it's very realistic. Yeah, this actually harkens back to the uh, very, very old days of Disney doing yeah, animation glass. with the uh, multi-plane camera, if anyone's familiar with some history there. Uh, where he would do the same thing, just have all his layers and then have a camera kind of 
uh, do the different depths of it and kind of see it all put together. But um, yeah. So once you have your visual uh, aspect completed, that's when they would get sent off to the audio department and then they add in all your sound effects and voices and music and then they do one more render with everything together and bam, that's it. <laughs> yeah. And those, that's pretty much true for both industries. That, uh, to my knowledge, is not much difference between North America and Japan. They kind of all do that same process where you kind of set off all your final frames and animations, you set it off compositing. Compositing is also where you do a lot of special effects, so any like sparkles, twinkles, like extra things that you want to draw by hand, um, you would have those there. So, Let's see if we have time to show that. Uh, I think we do. The end of the Gynax video is a little bit about how Gynax does compositing on some scenes. It's a pretty cool one. Uh, not this video. Oh. <laughs> It's like the last minute. This one? Yeah, oh no, 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 the top one. Layout is critical. Somewhere around there. It's a little bit before that. Before, before. Before. Close enough. <laughs> okay, so pretty much this composer guy is explaining to uh, Marina that um, each scene is, has its own composition. So depending on the desired effect, this is how many layers that could be applied after the animation. This is not even like, <laughs> this is all after stuff. Adding light, highlights, sparkles, spatter, stuff flying around. <laughs> It can easily go up to like over a hundred layers in a scene, so yeah. <laughs> and that's it. So actually we wanted to open up to you guys, because mm -hmm. you've been patient listening to us talk for all this time. So we wanted to do a little Q&A, so if anyone's got questions about the industry, have any questions about anything that's been sort of on your mind that you're not sure about, you want to ask us, feel free. Um, we'll go from there. And otherwise, we do have a table in the artist alley. You feel free to uh, stop by if you have any questions or. Yeah, we've got a question. Uh, when you're editing a scene with the wings, how much time do you put into that? Oh gosh. Uh, I think the rough, I must have done it in one sitting, so it was probably about six hours straight. Yeah, and that was only like, I don't know how many frames, 18 frames? <laughs> Go ahead. I have a quick question. Oh, how do you decide how many in betweens to put in between two keyframes? Uh, that really depends on the timing. So if you want the action to be slow, you would put more keyframes in between or in betweens. And if you want the action to be pretty fast, sometimes you won't even put any in between there. I didn't catch that last part, sorry. <laughs> be more smooth with the more frames that you have. Um, the less frames is typically faster and then if that gap is too big then sometimes it just it looks like a jump. It also depends on what kind of um, scene you're doing. So for typically yeah. for an action scene you would have maybe like you know your two keys in between an action of like you know somebody punching you might only have like four frames or six frames depending on how quick you want that impact. You can do, you can get very technical and you can get like, 
you can favor a keyframe, so your drawing will be more closely mirrored to the next drawing, which means that like you can alter your timing like that as well. So you can have less. You can only have like four drawings, but of those four drawings, you know maybe three of them favor one key and only favor the other one. So that's where you get into very technical kind of breakdowns of what you want to do. Okay, yeah. All right, we're going for a leather jacket, girl. <laughs> Yeah. Right now, we're pretty much taking on um, client contracts and while well, working on our own pilot episode. Uh, so, are you looking? Your question was. Um, oh, right now it's pretty much myself, and I have one more person looking after the administration. But that's pretty much it right now. <laughs> We're still kind of getting started since I started working on the on the company full time just in March, so we're still pretty fresh. Okay, thank you. Good. Uh, how long does it take to, to make one episode? Uh, um, good question. That's actually a very good yeah. question. Yeah. So from typically from like script to final what you see on television, it can take anywhere from half a year to a year actually to do like that's not for episode. That's for the whole season. So yeah. you would usually you usually would take quite a bit of time to do yeah. that. Like, um, oh, how long take each episode? Is it because it upload once a week? So like each episode things. usually takes up to six months months of production, from script all the way to final render. So to produce a series, you'd be looking at it. I don't know. It depends on the studio again. Maybe a two week gap in between each episode being produced. So by the time you're seeing episode five. Episode ten is already in production. It's it's stagnated. So think yeah. of it like steps. So like there's they're not doing them like one for one. Usually you'll have a large team who will be tackling like a chunk of it. So even though you see it on TV, the stuff um, afterwards is probably already done. But they're not done the entire thing. They're probably still working on the last like you know maybe five episodes, depending on the series and depending on um, how big it is and so on. And how many people involved in a series? Uh, that also varies uh, by studio and by budget. Usually, um, if you count your writers, your leads, animators, you can have up to like 50, 60 to 100 people, depending. Your animation crew will always be the biggest because you always need animators, you need in-between animators, you need key animators, you need cleanup artists, and so on. So you're going to be looking at a relatively large crew for animation, and that's true in both um, North America and Japan. Yes, yes, very, very true. You, we actually do. Um, I've done it myself in a lot of scenes when I've animated things. I've had to take videos of either myself um, or of someone else, or you go on YouTube and try to find something. But yeah, it'll, it, it's imperative that you take reference for I things. I guess like uh, the Avatar series, they hired um, martial artists to come in and they filmed them doing their scenes. So they pretty much matched how they were fighting in the animation. There's a, a good example of that, if you're curious, you can go online and look for it, is if you ever see the uh, Mr. Bean animated series, uh, which is done a couple years ago, they actually filmed Rowan Atkinson doing all his scenes while he was talking. He would actually act out his scenes in the sound booth while he was uh, doing his dialogue. I mean, he didn't really talk, it's Mr. Bean, but <laughs> he would act out the actions for the animators, and it was pretty much a great help for them to do that. So. I'll go with this gentleman over here. How well does it pay versus film? Ooh, I think they're kind of different. Pretty different. Because you've got complete writers, in fact, artist writers, that you would think would be paid very well for their amazing film. Again, really depends on the studio and the project and who the writer is. Uh, I went to a panel, a talk down at CTN Expo last year. That's in Burbank, California. And this one writer who did a Swan Princess and a whole bunch of other Disney movies, he was uh, explaining how he does make a decent living, but again, um, how can I put this? <laughs> it's because he has so many credits. 
basically. So he, he makes it easy to live in. Yeah, but someone breaking in, it might be very difficult. Like he got lucky when he was uh, taking out the trash in the studio somewhere, and he's like, oh, hey, uh, he f or someone went through the trash and found a script or something like that. So, you know, he had one of those really rare opportunities. Quite a, quite a, yeah. Usually question. it takes a lot of work to get up there. <laughs> the other question is, how do you pay the actors? Um, do you mean like the voice actors? Like the... Uh, the in, reference. In actors. Avatar, for example. Yeah. They weren't really actors, as you said, they hired yeah. our stars. Are they well paid? That I can't tell you. Uh, yeah, in that case I believe they... I mean, I'm... Avatar's budget for the cartoon yeah. actually is probably one of the largest yeah, in most cases. So each episode costs about uh, half a million dollars to make. Mm -hmm. So that's a large budget yeah. for that kind of a show. A very average budget for an animated show would be between two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars per episode. So yeah. for him, I'd imagine it probably compensated him quite well for that to come in because he had to mentor like all the leads and most of the um, higher up animators and say yeah. like to kind of teach them through it. So I'd imagine his his wage would be quite good. Um, and, you know, it could be a contract basis where you would come in as a on-need basis. It might not be like he's there full-time all the time. So it sort of just depends. But that's also a rare case. Most of the time they will not really have an actor per se come in and assist the animators, unless it's something very specific in this case, which it was. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, why does anime look a lot more detailed than, let's say, Hanna-Barbera, or even like, I don't know, something more recent like Gravity Falls. Every single time I watch anime, the clothes are very, very detailed. Mm -hmm. All the stylization is very detailed. Why is that? I think this goes back to the origins. Um, pretty much in North America, Animation was very well animated, so they would do 24 drawings per second, for example. When Japan took up animation, uh, I think they were trying to be conservative, and that's when they developed the limited animation style. So they would animate things on layers. And that's why you would get this super detailed underlayer, like a body of someone standing there, but then only their arm is moving or their mouth is moving. So they would only animate the arm or mouth on a separate layer. So that way they would conserve some work. And that's how they can make some pretty detailed drawings without, you know, spending three times as long on each drawing. It kind of goes, like Tiffany was saying, it does go back in history quite yeah. a bit. There was a large, um, Japan's film industry was actually quite bad in, after the wartime, after the Second World War. So in order to compensate, they found that their animation series were actually picking up a lot more than their film. So I think in a way for them, they viewed they it as, it. they wanted to push it, yeah. and it also goes back to their culture, right? Like yeah. if you see very traditional Japanese paintings, they're very detailed and they're very lush. So I think that also carried over in tradition to animation for them. Whereas in North America, I mean, animation didn't really kick in until, oh goodness, like probably like 19, 17 or so, that's probably when it was just beginning, and even then it didn't really become mainstream until uh, just after the Great Depression with studios like Max Flesher and Disney and all of them kind of That's up. pretty much why all the designs are so simplified back at that time, is because it was so much work to draw frame by frame by frame by frame. And eventually, when we get to the UPA, you know, Flintstones and that kind of thing, that's when they started going more towards the limited animation style and uh, playing a lot with that but they still wanted to keep their traditional cartoony style and was still simplified. Yeah, so, and even further, like some shows now, um, like Avatar is an example of stuff where it's a little bit more detailed than your average sort of North American show. It kind of blends because it's not a pure North American show. It is, does take a lot of inspiration from, from anime, clearly, and you can kind of see it all throughout. Um, so shows like Gravity Falls, regular show, you know, anything like that, obviously they're much more cartoonified. And that's, it's just a cultural sort of thing. It's not to say that we couldn't do a show that's more like that, it's just, it would require a lot more effort. Um, if you see something like G.I. Joe Renegade, that's a little bit more closer to that. You see the G.I. Joe characters a lot more detail, clothing, weapons, etc. Um, but for the most part, you'll see more geometric style shapes, more organic shapes, things like uh, you know, Justice League, Batman, uh, Flintstones, that kind of thing. squash. Yes, a lot of that kind of principle going on, so. 
Go ahead. That is a good question too, um, and you know, uh, so actually, yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, it is, it is difficult. I mean, even myself, when I started, I didn't get a job right away out of school. I actually took quite, some, quite a bit of time to get into it. Um, one way to get in the door is to know where you're applying to, first of all. Where do you wanna go? Which studio do you wanna apply to? And sort of start catering your work to their needs. Because um, as good as you might be on your own, if you can't do what they want you to do, it doesn't really matter to them. You know, like they they look for the ability for you to like draw very well, animate very well. But if you do your own style too strongly and you cannot adapt to what they are looking for, they will not hire you, regardless of how talented you are. Yeah, you um, pretty much have to match the style of the studio or whatever show they're working on. <laughs> you just have to prove to them that you can match it perfectly. That you can't tell a drawing from one artist from another artist. So in that case, it's a little restricting. Like getting into something like character design and that visual development of a show, that's like super difficult to get into. Because a lot of the time the studios are taking on franchises and already existing intellectual properties. So you pretty much just have to do what those other guys want you to do. <laughs> but to more directly answer your question, just keep practicing, like keep going at home, make little animations on your own put them up and then just kind of like, just keep showing them, like keep reapplying to places too, even if you try at a place and they don't get back to you or they turn you down. If you show persistence, that actually sometimes helps quite a bit more too because sometimes people give up on the first try. But if you're persistent, you go back and you say, look, I've improved my work, look, I've done more, then they, that will actually probably encourage them to say, well, you know, you're, you're, you're on the ball, you know, you'll keep going with it. So they'll probably end up hiring you at some point. Sometimes you might have to take another position as well, something that you mm -hmm. might not want to do right away. You right. might have to take a more junior position yeah. doing something that's not. the door, that's like the first step. Yeah, exactly. Just try to get in. Once you're in, it's immensely easier to move yeah. around departments because you can meet people, you can chat with them, you can show them work personally, and then you can move up and around. And once you've had one or two jobs, it gets a lot easier to get around because then you have some industry experience. All right, no more questions? We're good? All right. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. Hope you enjoyed.